Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much, especially to them, to the them. As she said, um, like we took we took a year and a half to organise this, and it was mostly because of our constantly changing circumstances. And she's been incredibly patient and accommodating and resilient in, in making it happen. So we're very uh, very grateful. Um, we're gonna do a presentation that's probably going to be about 50 minutes uh, long, where we're gonna. Um, present um, a handful of principles for creative resistance and two examples of our work and uh, the work of others um, to illustrate some of these principles that we think are key to the to art activism. But first of all, um, just to warm up because we're going to be sitting here, well, you're going to be sitting here for a while, I said, I would like to invite all the people here who define themselves as women and have ever worn trans, oh, just one thing, if we start I'm talking too fast. Don't hesitate to uh, show we, you know, this, this should not be the way it works that people who speak Hungarian should adapt to us. We're very sorry that we don't speak, I think we don't speak one word of Hungarian. It's really <laughs> shameful. But don't hesitate to, um, to show if we're going too fast. So, be reminding, could I invite all the people here who define themselves as women and who have ever worn trousers in their life to please stand up? Worn trousers that have been wearing. <laughs> and please stand up, stay standing up. Could I ask of the other people who um, have enjoyed a weekend um, whilst they were working, a paid weekend, uh, could you please stand up? Like getting a weekend off work. Please stand up. Yes. Did you ever um, um, <laughs> you mean whoever had a weekend off, anyway. or you mean whoever had a weekend I, uh, ever in your life? Even just one. Um, please stand up if you ever use contraception. Any form of contraception, the pill, condoms, like, please stand up. I think everyone is standing up, but I could have carried on. They said, please stand up if you have ever been on strike, if you ever read an independent media or newspaper, listen to an independent radio. Um, these could be the list. What do you, what do we have in common? I can't believe you're still standing <laughs> What do you all have in common? Privilege. Privilege? Yeah? Anything else? We are free. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> oh, I think that's good reason to be. So, we are on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, yeah, we're humans. But what else? What actually connects all these things? Basically, hmm? well, basically all these rights, even the most basic rights as wearing trousers uh, when one is a woman, was actually brought by disobedience and fighting. Instead, they were these were not rights that were um, gently given away by philanthropist authorities. They were won through um, struggle, that every one of these rights were actually gained through people who had the courage to break the law in order to, uh, to gain them. And we feel that considering the political um, context at the moment, it was, it was worth um, bearing that in mind. Don't hesitate to, uh, to sit down again. And that's done for the um, sentence from Oscar Wilde that said disobedience in the eyes of in the eye of anyone who read history is our original virtue. It is through disobedience and rebellion that progress will be made. And so disobedience is a bit one of the basis of our practice uh, and of our philosophy. Uh, but there are other principles, and we're going to talk about those principles. So 
First principle is sense worlds, feel worlds. Um, back in the 80s, I was in a collective uh, that was called Platform that still exists now, and we made this postcard which said the question of art is no longer one of aesthetics, but the survival of the planet. So I would no longer say survival of the planet because the planet's going to last. Uh, perhaps now I would say the survival of uh, 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 diverse life forms on this planet. But the key question is the question of aesthetics. What does aesthetics mean? Aesthesis, it comes from the Greek. It means to sense, to feel. To actually feel the world in your guts. To actually feel it in your stomach. When I was uh, 14, my father died of skin cancer. Now, one could say it was due to the ozone uh, layer hole. And my mother, I didn't talk, I was a boy, I had been taught to not express my feelings. Uh, and my mother said, you, you know, how you need to see a specialist, you're not talking, we'll take you to the doctor. So we went to the doctor, and uh, I sat on the chair opposite the doctor, he had a big, big, big desk. And I, uh, he, the doctor looked at me, it was the same doctor who dealt with my father as he was dying. And the doctor said, John, how do you feel? And I opened my mouth, and I projectile vomited across his desk. <laughs> and sometimes I wish I could still feel like that. I wish I could still sense the world like that. But some of those feelings were broken by education. So uh, I went to uh, theatre college initially, uh, where I, taught, I was taught that there should be a big separation between the stage and the audience, and maybe even a big hole. Uh, to make sure the audience and the stage don't, don't mix. Uh, then I went to art college uh, after theatre school. Uh, and in art college, I learned that, uh, above all, art must never be useful. Because that would be bad art. <laughs> uh, and so in the 80s, I was very involved in kind of performance art. And so I body art, performance art. I was inspired by people like Chris Burden. Here he's mailing himself to his Volkswagen. Uh, and I thought that you know, doing these kind of uh, works was radical. This was radical art. But I, I soon re realized that actually I was doing the same kind of thing to the same kind of people in the same kind of spaces. About 500 people would come to the same performances all the time, and perhaps this wasn't so radical as I, as I thought. In fact, it was just people watching. In fact, it was separate individuals watching the theater of horrors. Hurricane Irma recently was the strongest ever in the Atlantic, 
It was the longest storm ever recorded, and it was about the size of France and could be seen from space. But the most extraordinary thing was it was the first storm ever to actually be recorded on a seismograph, which means it was recorded on a thing that normally records earthquakes. So a machine to measure earthquakes was actually responding to a storm. The more recent storm, Ophelia, some of the maps, that are computer program maps, had never predicted that this storm would be so far northwest, northeast. Uh, so it didn't even appear. The map itself cut it out because they hadn't programmed the computers to ever imagine that a storm would go there. So everything is off the charts, whether we talk about the heating oceans, whether we talk about the effects of this heating, the effects, the droughts, the pushing people off their land, the increased refugee crises of people trying to find a life because capitalism is pushing them off their land through the destruction of their life forms. Every chart is off. Today, just like any day, 200 species will be made extinct by capitalism, by economic growth, by this culture that puts money in front of life. And so everything is off the charts. And in a sense, no artist, no activist have ever made work in a moment in history where even the possibilities of human extinction are being talked about by scientists. We've never been here before. So one of the first principles for us at the Laboratory of Insurrection Imagination is give up representation. Don't show the world to people, but change it together. And so it's up to you. <laughs> Um, and so, when um, faced with great uh, tragedies and, and disasters, um, we don't want to actually make painting about wars. Instead, we don't want to represent the world. We don't want to comment on the on the war, on the problems. Instead, so we're not going to do a painting like Picasso in Guernica. We are not going to you know, do an Ai Weiwei putting live vests, displaying live vests. Um, on, a, on a monument, uh, we're not going to put, like um, Olafur Eliasson did um, in Paris during the um, climate summit in, uh, in 2015, we're not going to put um, bits of icebergs to watch them melt. That this is not what we feel is what is going to change things. And it's that, and the thing is that art may be beautiful. One of the problems is that, as a response, is that the problem is that politics is very often boring. Is that politics is too often about saying no, about going from point A to point B, carrying placards that say no, no to war, no to corruption, no, no, no. It's not exactly um, desire inducing. Whereas actually, capitalism knows how to tap into our desires. It knows how to make us want something because it does tap into our emotional landscape. It's that in a kind of totally unsatisfied, never ever satisfi satisfiable uh, desires. But this is what it does. And one of the things that we think is that we need to make resistance as sexy as capitalism is able to make itself. Um, because one of the issues is that very often cap uh, activists, especially um, on the left, have a tendency to want to convince people. With this idea that if people don't act, it's because they don't know. It's because they don't have the information, so we need to give them information, so we need to give them facts, we need to give them numbers. It's that, and then, you know, if we find a good enough graph, then they will realize what is going on and then they will act. We don't think that that's the case. We don't think that that's enough. It's not to say that research is pointless or that figures have no impact. It's just that they can never be sufficient because this is not what actually moves people. We're much more convinced by uh, this, um, this approach by um, um, our American friend Stephen Duncan, who's um, a theorist and an art activist uh, from New York, and he says polit politics is not solely or even primarily about reason thinking and rational choices. 
It's an affair of fantasy and desire. People are not, are rarely moved to action, support, or even consent by realistic proposals. They are motivated of, about by dreams of what could be. And this is in the way the role we feel artists and activists can play is to make resistance this um, enactment of, um, this embodiment of the dreams of what could be. Is that how do we make Resistance. How do we make the alternative and resistance desirable? And um, linked to this idea of desire and linked to this idea of, of refusing representation is another principle, which is take direct action. So for us, direct action is fairly simple. You see a problem and you act directly to stop that problem. You don't write to your politician. You don't do a demonstration to tell ask your politician to stop the problem. You put your body in the way. Now, I was lucky in the 90s in the England, we lived in England at the time, to be involved in a, the first direct actions I was involved in was a, a, a campaign against a motorway. There was a motorway that was going to destroy 350 people's houses and two old woodlands. And people stopped uh, the work by putting their bodies directly into the machines. And for me, this was suddenly like body art. This was like all the body art that I've been learning about in art college, except it was real, except it was really changing something. And it was beautiful. I mean, you could have uh, something you could never get a budget for an opera. I mean, imagine a budget for an opera where you have the mist, you have the trees, you have the white horses <laughs> running through. And you could never get that. But this was what was happening in the direct action movements against the roads in the 1990s in the UK. So it was not only, not only beautiful, but it was useful. Even though some roads did get built, 700 road projects were cancelled because it cost them too much money. Basically, the security, the police, uh, the fences, it cost too much money to, make the, to, to, to build these roads, and so they had to start to cancel them. And that was because people, people put their bodies in the way. 700 roads. 700 different road projects, yes. Um, now, of course, in the art world, uh, what happened, and so what happens is, uh, uh, I managed through doing this work to escape what Susie Galli, the art critic, calls the prison of the art world. She calls the art world a prison, I managed to escape that prison, but then found myself a bit more often in the prisons of the real world. Uh, this is my clown uh, being arrested, we'll get to clowns later. It was quite good because the police uh, report said, said I was a 22 year old female, and I was 40 years old, so that was... <laughs> um, and when you're uh, breaking the law in the art world, you get on the front page of Art Forum magazine or, or Flash Art or whatever. Uh, when you start to break the rules of the, the real world, uh, you end up being called things like domestic extremists. This is me surrounded my, by my friends. They don't all look so uh, criminal-like. They're actually amazing people. And what happens is also you see something different in the activist world, which is solidarity. You're always surrounded by your friends. You don't have the competition that I felt was very strong in the art world. Another principle is prefigurative politics. Enact your dream in the present. Uh, there's an amazing group of anarcho-feminist art activists in Bolivia called Mujeres Creando, and they say, be careful with the present that you create because it should look like the future that you dream. So after the anti roads movement, uh, we set up an organization, a collective, informal collective, called Reclaim the Streets. And the idea of Reclaim the Streets was very simple. We saw the streets as a commons. We saw the streets as somewhere where, which everyone had the right to. All the sociology shows that the more cars you have in the streets, the less people talk to each other. So the car itself is not only a polluting death machine, but it's also a privatization machine. It's a machine that privatizes this public space. And so we wanted to break this privatization by pleasure and parties and resistance. And so we would hold big street parties. And we'd hold street parties with thousands of people. Very simple. We'd come, we'd never ask permission, we'd take the street and we'd put a sound system, uh, play good old 90s techno and have a, have a party. And the idea was very simple, so it got re replicated throughout the world. New York, Prague, hundreds of different cities throughout uh, the world started to do these street parties. And in London, we uh, started to get a bit arrogant. We thought, well, we've taken the streets. Why don't we take a motorway now? 
And so at one point we decided to take a motorway. And 8,000 people came to the motorway, and on the motorway there were these dresses, uh, these kind of carnival figures that went up and down the motorway, and hidden underneath the dresses, and the police couldn't see them, and then the dresses would go next to the sound system, that, so they couldn't hear anything. But there were people underneath here with jack hump hammers, and they were drilling into the tarmac and planting trees into the motorway. And in that act, I learned a very, very big principle and a big lesson, which was that stories can change the world. So this story of the people planting trees in the tarmac got spread on the early days of the internet. And we started to work with people who we'd never normally work with. We were ravers, anarchists, artists, ecologists, uh, communists, just a whole bunch, mixed bag of folk. And we started to work with really traditional working class uh, dockers. And that was because they had seen the story of the, 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 the motorway and the, and the trees. And those kind of stories, that kind of imagination, breaks through normal, uh, the divisions within a class structure. So, you know, the imagination breaks through in, in a way that is really... A docker, sorry, a dock workers, people who work in the port. Yeah, in the port. Um, and as uh, the amazing poet activist Muriel Hutzaya says, the universe is made of stories, not of atoms. And so, inspired by all that, in 2003, uh, we um, set up the laboratory of insurrectionary imagination. At the time, with, a, with another artist that um, is now that left the lab for health reasons at the time. Carrying is carrying amazing work as an artist called the vacuum cleaner. Um, and basically, for the last 13 years, we've been bringing together, opening space, and re uh, bringing together artists and activists to create new forms of resistance and disobedience. Um, we've seen the importance that we certainly uh, believe in in the in the history of struggles, and this is really something that uh, we're very um, inspired by. There's obedience, but that takes on new forms, because we feel that we need to reinvent the forms and the codes all the time. Um, so we've been um, organizing a lot of trainings and, and workshops um, so that we can really get the synergies um, of these two constituencies um, together and it's like because very often we feel that it's a generalization but um, but we feel that too often artists have a tendency to be incredibly imaginative and creative and have a capacity to think laterally about problems but very often are trained to be very very egocentric um, and quite and have a lack of awareness or engagement with political uh, problems and political issues where on the other hand, um, activists are much more engaged, um, often more audacious, potentially more courageous, um, to do actions, but have a tendency to repeat the same old forums. Um, and what we try to do is to basically create the synergies between these two and get the, the courage, the engagement, and the, um, the creativity um, together. Um, so we've done micro um, actions like this, um, snowball fight between that was called the people versus the banksters um, so gangster bank bankers at the time that was in the at the time of the financial crash in in london where the the financial um, markets had just collapsed the banks were being bailed out um, so we invited people to go and um, show what they felt to the to the bankers and said he was the only one who accepted to play. So, um, we've also done uh, work with uh, young people that um, brought these wonderful ideas that are this kind of um, new take on the plaques that you find on benches a lot in, in London. Mm. Um, but we've done a lot more um, projects that were often much more substantial. Um, and all of them were rooted in one principle that, uh, that is that the movements are the material. That's uh, like an artist who knows her material, is that our material, our social movements. And for instance, we worked with uh, climate camps, that are protest camps set um, illegally without ever asking permission on the site of climate crimes. 
So this was in 2007 on the very side, the proposed site for the third runway at Heathrow Airport. So set up um, a camp that was self-managed, organized um, in, in neighborhoods. And the idea of the climate camps is that as much as possible, it's run horizontally without hierarchies, <coughs> um, but by sharing all the tasks and the responsibilities and trying to be um, a kind of example of the possibilities in running things uh, more ecologically. Um, and for instance, one of the principles that we applied at one of the climate camps was reframe. It's that during the climate camps, um, in, in Britain at least at the time, one of the objectives was to always have a mass action about the climate crime that was underlined by the, the camp. At Heathrow Airport, it was uh, the refusal of a third runway, runway being built, and government being of a government, they pulled out the usual thing of um, using terror laws uh, against, uh, against us. So we, they were pretending that we would um, put fake bombs in the, um, in the airport, and that therefore it was justified to use the terror laws against us. So we organized this, uh, this experiment. We usually prefer talking about experiments rather than projects, or certainly not pieces, because one of the things that we, that we defend is the possibility of failing. We feel that if you're scared of failing, you're blocking your creativity. So why we usually think through um, our projects as experiments. So the experiments um, at Heathrow Airport was to reframe this idea that we were armed instead and said, yes, we are armed with peer-reviewed science, actually. Science is on our side. And we uh, built these shields that were all carrying photographs of people um, impacted by climate change around the world and were sturdy because at the back there were the two second steps, you know, the one that you throw and that pop out, so that when we would get to the site of the mass direct action, which was to, the, the, the aim was to occupy the headquarters of the owners of Heathrow Airport, is that we would be able to go through with the, with the shields and have these tents to occupy the site. And um, what it allowed us as well was to have this kind of um, the possibility of going through police lines being protected by our shields and actually have quite powerful um, media images that suggested what in effect is happening in the world is that authorities do um, protect those who destroy and impact people affected by climate change. But we thought that that was um, a very good way of, um, to be able to do actions, but, but hacking doesn't have to be so sophisticated in a sense. When, when one wonders what else um, can this thing do, it can be as um, simple as hacking everyday objects like a, a supermarket uh, receipt. And um, our artist friend, My Dad Strip Club, did that and, um, and realized, or worked out rather, <laughs> that when you put, if you put items very carefully on the table, you can actually have messages. And she used this kind of work to actually trigger invisible theater uh, scenes. So, are you all aware of what invisible theater is? Is that you basically um, trigger, open, a scene that no one actually knows is in fact theatre. So basically she would go back to the to the cashier and say, I don't understand. It's that it says fuck Nestle, what is that about? And would basically we All the products were Nestle products as well. Yeah, all the products were Nestle products. Um, and she would do it for instance on buy Nestle no, Nestle day. It was a don't buy Nestle um, day. Um, and helped with one collaborator would start a discussion with the cashier and people on the on the queue to tell being like, oh, is that this is really spooky? Do you know about Nestle? And you know, is that that's probably you know something that we need to do something about, etc. Um, but there are there are other uh, ways of hacking. This is um, the work of a um, group from Czech Republic called Stormen. Stormen. 
probably not how you, you say it really. It is, okay. Um, who um, is a more high-tech uh, way of uh, doing things, but that one of the things that they did was, for instance, to, um, to hack the camera systems on the weather forecast um, sequence on television, where you usually have weather forecast with the presenter and an ideal landscape of the Czech Republic at the back, on which they just integrated a nuclear explosion. So the entire country thought that maybe there was a nuclear explosion going on and created the discussion um, about that. It just cut the cables of the camera and put them into a Mac and then put the camera back on. So it's not yeah. that complicated. They just put some special effects, but they found the live camera. Um, and sometimes it just uh, just requires a ladder. A ladder and some paint. That's that. And you can put some tender as you say to um, And one of the things, but in a way, one of the things that it really underlines is that it's really important to know your material. Um, an artist, a craftsperson, know her material really intimately. Is that a painter, a sculptor? Is that will know how the material um, reacts, how it changes in time? And is that, as John Berger, um, the wonderful writer, said, is that to improve something, you really need to know the texture, the life story of that thing. And this is what we need to know. We need to do as an artist activist.
because the, the idea is that that was basically during the um, financial crisis in Spain when the banks had been bailed out and people were um, evicted from their houses. Um, and that group is really a flamenco group and they've been doing tons of actions. They interrupted parliament sessions by having people singing um, to interrupt um, MPs that were doing uh, um, dis discourse speeches. Um, and they would take one out and as soon as one had been evicted, another one would start singing. And they would take the second out, another one would be singing. So they've been doing loads of actions, but doing it really, really well because flamenco is their is their thing. And that it kind of illustrates a little bit um, another principle that we're very uh, keen to implement is that it's replaced confrontation with confusion. Is that one of the things that especially the authorities, especially the police, is very used to is confrontation. They're trained to deal with it. Is that you can run into them, you can insult them, they know how to deal with it. Uh, they're less at ease with being um, confronted with something that is totally confusing. And that was one of the principles and the, 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 the core of the, uh, the Clown Army. We can explain much later, afterwards, why we're not necessarily so proud of what came out of the, of the idea. But initially, the Clown Army was based on uh, a combination of the ancient art of clowning, so it was not pretending to be clowns, it was really to learn the art of clowning, um, which is a very difficult art, and techniques of, uh, of direct action. And go into, this is a scene from uh, mobilization against the G8 in, uh, in Scotland in 2005. And uh, the Crown Army also closed um, recruitment um, offices for the army because they, they went as a battalion, went to uh, the recruitment center and said, oh, we've heard that you liberate people, that's what we do, can we join? Um, and we're creating chaos uh, in, the, in the center, so much so that it was closed. Uh, it was also um, able to create scenes <coughs> like putting lipstick on one's lips and go and kiss the shield that's again in, in Glen Eagles when we had done a tour, a recruitment tour of 200 clowns uh, during the, the G8 protests. And, um, and she managed to um, kiss like an entire line of shields. Um, <coughs> the, the magical moment was when they actually retreated with their shields covered in, uh, in kisses. And we're convinced that it had something to do with the kisses. So, so it's very much about uh, replacing this confrontative, confrontational attitude, something that was um, very confusing, but always still um, very confrontational, but in a different form. Upon death and blood and shakes out money and toxins, deserves an obscene body of deviant soldiers. Because combat requires solidarity, discipline, and commitment. We are an army because we are angry, and where bones fail, we might succeed with mocking laughter. We are stuck, neither here nor there, but in the most powerful of all places, the place in between order and chaos. Ladies and gentlemen, run away from the circus. Join the forces of the clandestine insurgent rebel clown army. <laughs> protests and uh, a battalion of clowns found a um, bunch of cops that were very bored and um, <laughs> challenged them into that, into that game. And it says that's the kind of magic that can um, happen with, it, with the clowns. That the, the clown only is a meme that spread throughout um, the world. This is Germany, New Zealand, Colombia. As I said, just that we felt that there were loads of problems uh, with it, so we were also the first deserters that were very um, still. But what were the problems? Pardon? What were the problems? It was badly done. <laughs> that, was, that, would, that would be the basic problems is that when the meme, the idea, because the, the confusion, I think that the meme was extraordinary, it was taken on by a lot of people that were not prepared to actually learn how to clown, but pretended to be clown. And there's nothing worse than actually people who pretend 
tend to be clowns, is that clowning is something that is magical, but you need to find your clown. And then this is when the magic happens, when you just pretend to be clowns. You just put on a red nose, you look stupid, you sound stupid, and you do stupid things. That would be our, <laughs> that would be our criticism in a nutshell. Um, but we can talk more about the problems with the, with the clown language. <coughs> Another principle is put your target in a dilemma position. Is that basically, like, if you have, when you have a, a target, make sure that they are themselves in a position where they're, where they're, where whatever they do, they will feel that they're, uh, that it's a mistake. Once upon a time, there was a little German town called Wunzi. Neo Nazis have been demonstrating there and overrunning the town. The small town was prepared. With the aid of its citizens, Lindsay will change the Nazi march into something wonderful, the most involuntary charity walk in Germany. For every meter that neo-Nazis marched, 10 euros were donated by citizens and small businesses to exit Germany. The neo-Nazi opt-out organization, motivated by banners and bananas, even the most unfit fascists, marched the whole distance on the watch of cheering Bundesliners and raised 10,000 euros for their own exit from the Nazi scene. But that was only part of the story, because as soon as the neo-Nazis started walking, a meticulously planned digital campaign kicked off. Together with pre-selected social media influencers and a viral film, the action spread in no time. If only the fear of you. <laughs> in the end, the most involuntary charity walk in Germany was a great success for Exit Germany and for Bundesliga. And this story might be a lot of things, but it's not a fairy tale. That's a perfect example, as far as we're concerned, of putting your uh, targets in a in a dilemma. So basically, the Nazis marching, whatever they did, is that they stopped and they had stopped, or they carried on and they were humiliated. So another important uh, principle um, is don't pretend to do politics in the art world. Um, that was very much illustrated for us um, in uh, 2009 during uh, the. Um, COP15, so the climate summit in uh, Copenhagen at the time, where, where in, like in every city where there is a, a climate summit, a United Nations climate summit, um, the entire art world becomes passionate about climate. Uh, so they're passionate about climate for a year and then they don't care again and then they care again when it's in another city. And we were invited by um, the uh, Contemporary Art Center in Copenhagen to do a project around uh, climate crisis um, and, um, and we're also invited by uh, a gallery in the, in the northwest, in the southwest of Britain. So we decided to join these two projects and um, propose to do um, a project that would be for the Reclaim Power Day, that was the, the action day during the um, the COP15, um, and because it was in Copenhagen and we had spent time in Copenhagen, we knew that in Copenhagen you have a lot of abandoned bikes, um, so we decided to uh, do a project that was called Put the Fun Between Your Legs, between Become the Bike Block, where we would recycle um, abandoned bicycles and turn them into tools of disobedience. We um, proposed this project to both uh, galleries and museums that they, they thought it was great. Um, and so we, did, we explained that we would um, do prototypes in, uh, in Britain um, and then bring the, the project to, um, to Copenhagen. Um, both of them said, yes, that's fine, but you know, we are white cubes, so you can't weld in a in a, in a white cube, said no problem, we'll do it in a container, both of them hired containers, it's great. Um, and we did the project in, um, in the Arnofini Gallery in, in Britain, so turned the gallery into um, an installation space, a um, workshop space, and then about eight weeks before the, um, the project was due to uh, go to Copenhagen, we received a phone call from the curator 
we said, okay, Pantane has been ordered, it's going to be on the main square, it's going to be great. Um, by the way, um, in Denmark, there are quite strict regulations to what is a bicycle. So it has a certain length, certain width, and a certain number of wheels, blah, blah. So if your design is not within these, um, these regulations, we'll have to send it to the police, and they'll validate that it should take about three weeks. So if you could send us the designs that you've come up with, um, in Bristol, that would be great. Well, it's a civil disobedience action, so we don't quite care whether the bikes are legal or not. <laughs> and there was this great pose and this memorable answer, which was, you're really going to do it. And then, well, the proposal you received had civil disobedience about 12 times in it. We talked about the day we're going to do it, is that of course we're going to do it. She was like, oh. Well, that's going to be really difficult for us. She had not realized, she could not conceive that actually we would go out in the streets and disobey, as we had said we would. Um, so it turned out that she had to give up on the, on the project. Um, and it was um, an activist space that welcomed us. Um, and then where we actually built the double, double trouble that had been um, designed in the other space. Um, so these were the, the big uh, bicycles. Uh, we also realized that actually one of the things about bicycles is that um, when they're normal bicycles, they're very mobile. Um, in a way, they're very mobile like a body, but they're faster than the body. So we organize trainings uh, for people to learn how to move like swarms, swarms of bees or a flock of birds in the, in the streets in small groups to be able to, uh, to disobey. We did role, um, act, like action play for, um, in the streets for them to know how to deal with the, with the police. And on the day, we actually, so it was the, the day, the big day of, uh, of action where people realized the People's Assembly about climate and what is happening in the UN is a, is a travesty. We need to organize the one that should happen. Um, and basically, the, the bike block play the role of allure. So we basically had loads and loads of bicycles on the street, taking all the cops away from the main, well not all of them, we tried to take as many as possible away from the, from the main action, using these um, figures because the big bicycles had been confiscated by the police that called them the um, war bikes. Obviously, um, but we still managed to, uh, to do a lot of uh, actions like this horse um, figure uh, to protect uh, people or to use them as uh, barricades. Um, vans don't run as well when they have so many bikes under them. We've tested it, it works. Um, but for us, one of the main, uh, one of the main things um, about these projects and these experiments is that actually friend all friendship is political. Um, and this is one of the things that we really want to, um, to uh, trigger in those in this project. And this is for us an uh, beautiful in illustration of this, again, Mojeas Creando, that says, be careful with each other so we can be dangerous together. And this is one of the objectives of these experiments. And uh, so we work with the social movements, but we also always have one foot in the art institutions. And so the, some of the bikes that we did design there, then what you, we did them in a in a, in more art context, but again went to the streets. This was a five-channel pirate radio bike, uh, and we took that into the streets of Hamburg with loads of other bikes with radios <coughs> to make a kind of moving concert. And in the end, that bike itself ended up in the Victorian Albert Museum in an exhibition called Disobedient Objects. So this kind of always working in the disobedient world, in the activist world, but also never ignoring completely the art world. But sometimes the art world fucks you over, and you fuck them over. Uh, and this, is the, this, this story is, um, the principle is, abandon your cultural capital. Uh, so have the courage to actually abandon, cultural capital is what we build as artists. We're taught to build our cultural capital so that we get invited to more museums and more galleries and so on, and that's what we build. So we think politically sometimes you need to abandon it. So we were invited to the Tate Modern, uh, it's the big museum in, in London, 
and they wanted to do a, a big thing on art and activism and have us to do a, a workshop. So they were very happy. They put us on the front page of their website, and the workshop was make was called "Make Disobedience." Uh, no, uh, disobedience makes history. Um, and uh, just before we did the workshop, they sent us an email which said, you know, we've got the room, we've got the video projector and everything, everything's fine, we've got uh, 40 people, 30 people, whatever. Uh, and there was one line in it that said, um, yes, but you must remember that ultimately it's also important to be aware that we cannot host any activism directed against TAKE and its sponsors. However, we very much welcome and encourage a debate and a reflection on the relationship between art and activism. <laughs> So, who are the sponsors of the Tate? Well, it's not Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, it's actually uh, BP. This is the ex-CEO uh, of BP, who also has to uh, were sponsoring uh, the Tate. He's also on the board of trustees of the Tate. So, BP and Shell sponsor nearly all the museums uh, and public uh, museums in, in London. Why do they do this? Uh, they don't do it uh, uh, because they want to advertise uh, uh, Petrol. They don't want people to buy petrol. They know people buy petrol anyway. They do it because it's called a social license to operate. In London, in big cities like London, it's the bankers and the politicians who give British Petroleum and Shell permission to go and explore for oil. So those people go to these museums and they go, ah, Shell is great. Look, they're giving money to a museum. They must be a progressive. They're not an ecocidal, genocidal corporation. So it's kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's an art wash. It's cleaning the image of the companies. Uh, it's making us forget that they create wars. Uh, it's making us forget that they create climate catastrophe. So we started the workshop. We got people to talk about their experience of disobedience. And then we projected the email on the wall of the workshop. Uh, and the person who wrote the email was in the room, but we didn't say it was her that wrote the email. We said the Tate did it. And as the, act, as the workshop was called Disobedience Makes History, it was perfect. We said to the students, well, are we going to obey or disobey? Are we going to do actions against BP or not? And after a big discussion, the students said, yes, we will. And so then we were going to meet the next weekend. But between the two weekends, we got a phone call. Um, and we had to go and meet the Tate and meet a new, two new creators, uh, the head of security, the head of public uh, relations. And uh, it was a long, long, long meeting, about four hour long meeting where we explained politically why we were going to do an action against the BP and it was most important to do that. And they were like, ah, yeah, but you're going to make, it's going to force people to uh, pay for contemporary art if we lose the funding from BP. Many years later, we realized that actually the funding from BP was 1% of the budget of the, of the museum, nothing at all. Uh, but we were very powerful at that moment. And it illustrated a, a Zapatista quote, which we love, which is, we're already dead, therefore you cannot kill us. Because they thought that we would say, oh, yeah, yeah, because we one day want to have our retrospective in the Tate or another exhibition or another workshop. And we didn't care about that. So we were already dead in their eyes, and therefore we had incredible power. So during the workshop itself, the students just did a very simple thing because the curators tried to sabotage the workshop the whole time. At one point during the meeting with them, uh, I said, uh, so you're trying to censor us? And they said, ah, that's a very emotive word to use. <laughs> um, but uh, they tried to sabotage the workshop. But what happened two weeks after the workshop was um, the uh, Deep Horizons bill in the Gulf of Mexico, 3.19 million gallons of oil. And so it, perfect timing because BP was then going to celebrate a week later their sponsorship in the museum, so we celebrated with them, bringing lots of molasses uh, inside and outside. And out of that came a movement that was called Liberate Tate, made up of lots of the students who had come into the workshop. And they did about 17 different actions throughout uh, seven years. Uh, and one of the principles they used was hack their laws. Now, there's a law in the UK which means that if you find in your grandma's attic a painting, a great, uh, like a Van Gogh or I don't know Monet, you have to take it to the you take you can take it to the museum and they have to accept it to see if it's a real painting and then they can have it as the gift to the nation. It's called the gift to the nation. So we thought, okay, we'll hack this law. So what we did, we thought we'll give the gift to them. And so what they did, the Red Tate brought a wind turbine. Hundred people brought a real wind turbine to the Tate. Uh, and left it there with all the paperwork saying, well, this is a gift for you, and you have to decide if you're going to keep it as an artwork or not. 
Um, and then the people went away, and the police came and had to work out what to do with the wind turbine. Um, there were loads of other actions, uh, a, a, an occupation where people were writing on the ground for 24 hours. None of, none of these actions were ever illegal. There was one action where people set up a, a tattoo part, a centre in the, in the museum, tattooing, uh, people, tattooing on people's arms the PPM, the parts per million of CO2. So the, more, the older you are, the less parts per million you have on your arm. Um, and another principle that was put into effect was least effort for greatest effect. So one of the most simple actions that happened there was simply having a naked body and covering the naked body uh, in uh, molasses, and they had to shut down all that part of the museum. And then it got uh, front page of the Financial Times uh, and uh, five minutes on the national TV. I think the action cost 30 euros. Um, and after seven years, uh, BP actually uh, ended their sponsorship of the Tate. Of course, the Tate said it was nothing to do with the resistance, but they always say that, don't they? Um, and the last principles here, uh, trust the unexpected, uh, but build revolutionary expectations. So if we'd been in this room, say in 1988, uh, and uh, we'd been talking about uh, uh, what, uh, what would bring down the Soviet empire, and we're like, we have to bring down the Soviet empire, but, but how can we do it? And someone had said, I know, uh, let's uh, get young people to dress up as gnomes uh, and put yellow orange hats on, and that could maybe set off a spark that could set off social movements and bring down this, the Soviet Empire. No one would have believed us. But uh, what the original alternative in Poland did exactly this. There were a bunch of artists and activists and hippies and punks meeting together, and they decided, after months and months of doing graffiti throughout the streets in Poland of gnomes with hats, saying, we're going to have a gnome gathering. Because it was military law in Poland, you didn't have the right to go out into the street. But how could the tanks come attack people who were dressed as gnomes and asking uh, for uh, gnome things, like down with Gargamel, king size for everybody, uh, and so on. And the tanks never came. And some political theorists and art historians think that this action was the first time 20,000 people took to the streets. It was the first time the public space but disobedience was opened in Eastern Europe, uh, and it led, of course, to the bringing down of the Soviet Empire. So the expectation uh, was, was little, but you have to build revolutionary expectations. And at that period, people were expecting something to happen, but they just didn't know how it was going to happen. And the last principle, become the territory and inhabit everything. So we used to live here, or not there, but kind of here, uh, uh, in London in the metropolis. And we slowly realized, after 25 years of living in the metropolis, that for us, everything that's done in the metropolis puts humans at the center. And humans can only relate to themselves. We can't create, create ourselves separately. Uh, we, we create ourselves separate from any other forms of existence, uh, any other forms of life. And for us, the city becomes this reign of the artificial over everything. And it commodifies everything. And we felt that to build revolutionary movements, perhaps we needed to leave the cities. And so we left our jobs, we left our flat, and we moved to rural France to set up a farm uh, and uh, to try and inhabit a territory. Um, but we were still a bit addicted to traveling, to this idea of having, there were global activism shows in art centers and festivals about art and activism throughout Europe. And like many of our intellectual and artist friends, uh, we were taken into this, this kind of network of going to show, work, and do at, at different festivals. Uh, and we never took the plane, because we think it's not coherent to be a climate justice activist and take a, an airplane, so we'd always take the train, but we were still traveling. And we, we have, in this culture, we have this thing that, basically, mobility is what gives value to our culture, to our Western culture. Not knowing somewhere. Not knowing where you live, knowing the history of that place, knowing the species of that place, but actually your capacity to move is what gives you, 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 you value. And we wanted to resist this. But we weren't managing. We kept traveling and traveling. And at one point, we were invent, invited to this commission in Hamburg, in a big theater in Hamburg. We did a big project there, which started with a 10-day training with young people. And at, at the end of the training, there was a show. And the show uh, involved the audience coming onto the stage at one point, uh, and um, 
deciding whether they were going to use ants to uh, sabotage banks. So these ants uh, go into the computers and sabotage banks. They're attracted to computers and they create uh, short circuits. And so the audience decided, yes, they were going to go and do this, and they wore these special edible costumes, and they went and put the ants into the banks. But another part of the show was we wanted to have a mushroom curtain that the audience would eat the mushrooms. They weren't magic mushrooms, they were just normal mushrooms. Um, and so we did all this work to build this curtain, 10 by 19 me 9 meters curtain, and the mushrooms started to come out after 10 days of putting water on them and everything, and then there was a heat wave. And the mushrooms didn't come out. They just stayed in. And we ended up having a very expensive, moldy curtain for the theatre show. This curtain should have looked like flesh. It should have had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mushrooms coming out of it. And so we were kind of depressed. The whole project was a bit of a disaster. And we got back home to our farm. And at the time, we were living in this tent on the farm. And as we got home, we opened the tent. And there were mushrooms all over the roof of the tent. And we thought, this is the problem. The mushrooms are telling us a very clear story. Inhabit where you are. Stop traveling around Europe all the time. To know a place, sometimes the farmers say it takes a thousand years to know a place. We need to inhabit and make and create in the places we are. And now, this is where we inhabit. It's the Zad. It's 1,650 hectares of land against an airport and its world. And we're going to be talking about it at its farms, and its tree houses, and even its lighthouse at Bolia uh, on Tuesday. So do come if you want to hear more about the Zad, and how the, this, for us, this art of inhabiting is this key thing that we need to do in the 21st century. And what this Zad experience has also taught us is the key aesthetic for the 21st century. We started talking about sensing the world, uh, isthesis, to feel, to sense the world. And for us, at the moment, we live right here, and this is the plan. They wanted to make an airport here, two runways here. This didn't happen. This remains. And for us, this sensing of the world, this, what remains when you stop the mega machine of capitalism, when it's been sabotaged and the desert has been halted, for us, when you hold back that machine, and you create something which decolonizes a place from capital, which opens up the potentials of creativity and resistance. For us, that is the beauty. The beauty is keeping somewhere alive. I'll just end with this quote from Alan Capra, who says, we may see the overall meaning of art change profoundly, from being an end to being a means, from holding out the promise of perfection in some other realm to demonstrating a way of living in the future. Thanks a lot. So we've got about uh, half an hour, 20 minutes for discussion, I think. Uh, I don't know what the time is. It's half past seven. Uh-huh. Yeah, around yeah. eight, but they're going to come and, and kick us out at one point, so go ahead if you have questions. I don't understand. You said you uh, moved out of the city because you couldn't fit like, the everyday life, for example, that requires living in the city? We, uh, we think that what happened I mean, the, what happens when you live in the city is actually this capacity to sense the world is broken because you're completely, constantly bombarded by a world which puts money in front of life, uh, constantly bombarded by all the, all the hyper-stimulus of the city, uh, and that you lose connection to your forms of existence. You don't know how your clothes are made. You don't know how your food is made. You don't know, how, you don't know really anything about your existence, in fact. And so we think that to be revolutionary, you need to hold on to your existence and be able to uh, uh, be, 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 be able to inhabit and not estranged from these things, not separate. So for us, living in a city, I mean, you're constantly separated from, from, your, from life and from existence. And we think it's, we think it's small town is what we're talking about metropolis and big, big, big cities. Uh, so that was why we... we Hi, I'm Christian. I'm an uh, activist for Greenpeace. So I, I started to, to think about cooperation. Uh, uh, you know, we do a lot of actions, direct actions, and you know, so 
and we, we are also passionate and, and committed. And our, our goal is very much similar to yours. So, is it any possibility to cooperate with you? Because your ideas and your creativity is just amazing. Just, okay, may, we, we may uh, talk about it later. So. Sure. But I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. But we're doing very happy. Shop, uh, tomorrow and the next day. Unfortunately, I will be uh, engaged tomorrow and the, and the day after with uh, Greenpeace, so I will not be able to, to come. But um, we are very happy to have you here. Great. Well, so. thank you very much. At the same time, and I think is that in collaborations with this or be inspired with this kind of idea, it's something that we're very committed to. And this is why we do the workshop, and I think that it would probably make a lot more sense to have people from here, like, you know, this is what we were talking about, is that it would make much less sense for us to come from France to bring ideas to, you know, Hungary, which is a context, a history we know very little about, a, a socio-political context that we don't know so much, as then, and we're really convinced that there are people here who have the same creativity, and think that this is, in a way, rather than, we're very concerned with not having this kind of consultant uh, mentality that I think is too much, that, you know, that I think is, is in a way, um, very often linked to um, colonial ways of thinking. So this idea that, you know, other people know better, that actually there's no one that knows better about the situation here, of people who are from here. So hopefully, like after, the two-day workshop, we will have shares these things. So there will be more people to. Well, we also had some some uh, pretty good and pretty you know, uh, let's say tricky actions. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I have no no pictures, but but I'm telling you there are some some very nice and, and uh, good examples also also in Hungary, but uh, but uh, you know in Europe as well. So for example, when uh, two or three years ago we were uh, we. Uh, got to Vienna when uh, uh, and we we also uh, uh, painted us with some black I don't know dye like you did uh, with uh, British uh, BP and we we appeared at uh, uh, what's the name of the, the Austrian company OMV the headquarter of OMV in in black um, uh, bathing suit and you know, totally black, and telling that um, they wanted to to set up some uh, some drilling uh, platforms uh, on Asia, Adriatic Sea. So we were kind of protesting uh, against it, and uh, those pictures came the, the the pictures of the day. So when we still were there, and the the, the back uh, back part of the buses uh, just contained our pictures. <laughs> Really nice, and UMV, UMV uh, just stopped being part of this uh, project. So it was, it was good. <laughs> so you said you don't travel, but still you're here. <laughs> no, we don't. And then we don't, don't spend our life traveling. I mean, we still make our living from this kind of thing, doing workshops, so we still travel, but much, much less than we I think that the traveling, what John did mention was, I think there is also um, uh, a feeling of dissatisfaction and exhaustion about the very ephemeral uh, nature of even the activist things that we were doing, is that, that you know, you do climate camps, which are, you know, which we still very much believe need to happen. But after years and years of going to these things that are amazing, but for a week, and then you go home and you kind of go back to your life. In our case, we were living in a, London, in a flat in London. I was a university lecturer, and it's like, and after a while, it just felt like the, the, the everyday texture of our life was not coherent. Um, enough with what we believe in is that, that actually doing these actions, even though we were doing them quite often, is that it was also this kind of ephemeral nature that we got very tired of and we really wanted to have an everyday that felt very much in line with what we believe in.
And so living on the Zad is a perfect example of that, that just by living there, in a way, you're blocking the construction of a major capitalist infrastructure. So even just everyday life becomes an act. It's not this, and you're building for the long term. You're not just in this, kind of, as Isa said, this kind of event list all the time. You know, spending a year, I have loads of time spent a year organizing a one-day thing. <laughs> and you kind of get to a point and go, wow. You know, and it could be a one-day thing, and it was an incredible thing, and changed you know, history to some extent, but still, it's just wanting to like the everyday, merge art, activism, and the everyday life. Um, as far as I understood, uh, your actions are trying to just deconstruct this like binary between like, being an activist and being an artist. Uh, but like considering the okay, like this artistic production and activism and this authenticity, the idea of authenticity in within these like two seemingly uh, different spaces. So I am curious, how do you just locate yourself? Like, okay, there's no. I'm 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 pretty sure that you never prioritize any kind of like you know this identity of like whether being an activist or artist, but an activist art in general. But for instance, if an like ordinary activist just who used to throw a lot of scones towards police, one day decides to become a clown and he or she m might make such stupid performances and it may so there has to be an authenticity in that sense because that is why you said while discussing this like being can like uh, it may end up in this stupid way so an ordinary activist can become an artist in that sense or you need to you know there should be a like knowing subject in, in that regard whether know how to disrupt the whole spectacle where to intervene so uh, like as far like the, the thing that I understood, like I got from your presentation, is that if you have an like this artistic aspiration, then you can only become uh, um, like act, art, like activist artist. But the vice versa would, is not that possible. I mean, I don't, I, yeah, I don't. I, I would not say that. I think that first one of the things is not so much about knowing the knowing subject is that we're. We're very um, close, or we very much make our own this uh, Balinese definition of art that is paying attention. So it's like for us, something becomes art when you've put all the attention you have into it. So it's not so much about knowing or not knowing about doing doing it in an expert way. Um, is just doing it with attention. And the example about the clown army is that it was not so much the fact that it was stupid, is that there was no attention being paid, is that the, the, the very the, the core of the practice of clowning had been evacuated because things, it was, it was a form that became consumed. Is that people saw, saw how some of the actions had worked really well and just wanted that to almost in a consumer way. So, kind of put on the, the aspect of it, so put on the costumes, put on the mode, but had no, no attention put into it. And, it. and therefore when it, when it was not so much that it was not expert, is that the magic was gone. And therefore the actions didn't work, is that we saw clown actions actually put people into danger more than actually having this, uh, this magic happening where you can really get the police being so frozen that they are, they, and, but at the same time it's also that with the, with the clan army is that there is a point where it doesn't work anymore because, because when the form has been used and reused and re-reused it's like the cops know how to adapt it's like you know in Britain we could, we've heard them actually saying to each other they're going to start what they call the fission move so they even knew how we called our you know, ways of moving and it's like in Germany they were like well you know Clowns are not allowed within 15 meters of the police. And that's the case, is that you need to reinvent the thing. So. And also, we, we, we kind of we think there's in a way a problem with both the term artist and activist, in a way, uh, because the term artist suggests a kind of monopoly of creativity, that this person has the creativity and other people don't. And activist is the same thing, it suggests that these people have the kind of monopoly of social change. 
and that other people don't. And these people know how to change society. And in fact, society is changed by many, many people who never concern themselves as activists and who do disobedience in their everyday life or, or, or disobey you know, through, through non-organized forms, forms. So for us, actually, both terms are equally problematic in a way. Um, we kind of like the idea of an art of life uh, and using this idea of attention, that life itself should be this paying attention, uh, of really giving a deep attention to something. Uh, in the way that Foucault talked about an art of life, that, you know, that not, not just an object or a, a house can be an art thing, but life itself could be this, this practice that, that is about attention and, and pushing the potentialities of what you can do in life to, 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 you know, to, to beyond what you thought was possible. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, I have a question. It's about the reaction of the public. Uh, when uh, there are talks about public uh, disobedience, I often hear critics that, oh, you shouldn't occupy a street, for example, because it will make more difficult to go to a job or to school or just live our daily life. And then people react to this activist in a bad way and not a happy way. How, how do you deal with that? How did you experience this aspect of activism? I mean, I'm certainly very convinced by the logic that once said you're not necessarily there to please people and that there are loads and loads of groups um, for instance I, I, I noticed that it's on at the moment so uh, we have nothing to do with it so I can publicize that there is an amazing film that is about the, the very beginning of ACT UP in France called 120 BPM that really shows how much ACT UP when it started was, do you all know ACT UP? It's, um, it's an organization that started in the late 80s to um, deal with the um, AIDS epidemic. The fact that they actually uh, mobilized because AIDS was totally not acknowledged as an epidemic because it was seen as the gay disease and no one cared. And so people were dying by their thousands and ACT UP mobilized and organized a lot of direct action where they really did not care about whether people would like it or not. They also did a lot of um, um, political work and legal work and work with the labs. So it was not just these direct actions, and I think that that's very often very important to have a, a wide range of different actions. But, but it really, that film is wonderful at showing how much in a situation of crisis, is that in the situation that they dealt with, for instance, is that literally people were dying. Is that they were like every week people were just losing friends by their dozens, and it was just like we're no longer on this idea that we're gonna, you know, please people. And if you look at most of the successful um, uh, social movements. Very, very few of them were there to be nice to people. It's like if you look at the civil rights movement in the, in the United States, black people did not try to nicely convince white people, to, could you please stop being such racist fuckers? You know, so they actually started doing direct action that, um, in their case, found an economic leverage and you know started costing money as then the, the Montgomery. So if you do, I guess probably most people have heard of Rosa Parks, the famous woman who um, refused to actually go to the back of the bus when white people um, got in. And that triggered um, a very widespread boycott of the buses by black people. And, and that was the beginning of the end of segregation because basically the, um, the white owners of the bus companies were like, this is costing too much, just do something. It's like, you know, call the authorities. To, so I think that sometimes there is um, what I personally feel is an NGOification NGO of activism where a lot of NGOs just want to always be nice mm -hmm. and be liked. And I think that in some situations you're not there to be liked, you're there to try to make a difference. And that doesn't mean to become cynical or to not care and, and be actually arrogant towards people, I think that that's the line to find. Um, but 
You know, like I think that you could talk about in the industry. It's also about having a, a position beyond the individual. I think you know a lot of these critiques are always very individual, individualist critiques, and, and to be able to actually show people to some extent that actually the problem is is a systemic problem and much bigger than you know than that person thing. But yeah, I mean it's, it's something you'll get all the time, and you know when the civil rights movement started to do their actions, they were very interested in theatre and they rehearsed a lot of their actions. So the actions, the famous actions where people sit in the <coughs> lunch, uh, they would go into the cafes where they weren't, the black people and white people would have to have different places in the cafe, or some cafes had no white people, and no black people. And so they would go in and they would sit and they would eat as if they were, had permission, and they rehearsed everything with cigarette <coughs> smoke and blowing cigarette smoke into each other's eyes to keep calm in the thing. And they hadn't ever expected that actually people were gonna put cigarettes onto their skin, you know. Uh, so of course there's always gonna be these, you know, mm -hmm. extreme uh, uh, responses. Uh, it's kind of part of the job is to navigate that and keep to what you wanna do without, you know, but at the same time, you know, being strategic about it. Um, and I think that this is where the creativity in the form can be a, a genuine way of circumventing that kind of thing is that if you're just blocking a street um, in a way that you know the only thing that people see is the fact that they can't get to work they don't understand why and it's just like then yeah I think that is very likely that you're only gonna get this kind of reaction that is very easily manipulated afterwards but when the forums become more creative it's like then then it creates something else. I think that, for instance, that was that was the real power of the street. Like, yes, they were blocking. You were could be a bit pissed off, but at the same time, it's like you know, you were pissed off. If people are having an absolute, you know, amazing time. So you know, it's that it created something else. And always also be aware that you know all media has always criminalized social movements. You know, so you know this idea of trying to get good media. It's also an NGOization of, of struggle. You know, I mean, if you look at the media for the suffragettes, you know, the women who were trying to get votes in the turn of the last century, you know, the media was calling them animals and saying that women have smaller brains and shouldn't vote anyway. I mean, you know, incredible attack, and it continues. You know, anyone who's been involved in in radical struggles knows that you know you get that attack by the media, and you, you've just got to keep you know going, knowing that one day people will look at this stuff and go. Of course they were right. <laughs> of course they were right, and now they're the heroes, and now they're the ones who change, change things. Is maybe the way we think about the time, uh, temporality, and efficiency of movements, maybe also kind of the idealization of movements? Because I think nowadays those who make activism have to face this all the time, this kind of play. Is it affecting what you do? Is it um, when when do we see the result? To think? Just like. Some days ago, there was a sit-in of some activists um, in a restaurant against corruption, state criminal corruption, and uh, local government supported corruption. And uh, one of the TV channels, ATV, um, made a big survey uh, amongst their uh, viewers about do they think uh, the government gives a damn <laughs> about this, uh, this action and similar actions, which are quite a lot nowadays. And over 70% of the, the viewers said, no, they don't do that about it. And you know, there was a talk then in the, there was a show, a, a talk show in the, in the TV uh, with um, participants of this action, but also political philosophers. And the interviewer was asking this same question for the whole time. And I was really shocked in a way, because of course this, this is a question that we need to deal with. But uh, isn't this kind of um, um, insisting on this and not uh, listening to maybe this can start something or what other effects we can talk about? Um, could it be this uh, another solution for this phenomenon? Because I, I think nowadays, I mean, like um, we are, we seem to be full of uh, failure histories of of, um, of um, uprisings or or movements nowadays from Arab Spring to. Uh, Occupy Wall Street and in Hungary, of course, we also tend to see everything that's happening in the past years as a failure because, of course, uh, the Orban government will probably be re elected next year, maybe yeah, even yeah. with an extreme right uh, <laughs> coalition partner. 
So you know, it's it's just I don't know. We need to have answers, or we need to like for our mental health, maybe. <laughs> as, as activists. There is there is a very good book for uh, mental health on exactly that issue that is called Hope in the Dark by Rebecca Solnit. Mm -hmm. That that actually starts. Um, with this amazing quote by Virginia Woolf, the title comes from this amazing quote by Virginia Woolf, who was writing in 1916, for a point where I was reading, and she said, um, the future is dark, and that's probably the best it can be. And what she meant was not, you know, oh, I love dwelling in the, you know, horror of what's happening. What basically she was saying is that it's dark in the sense that we don't know what is going to happen. And that's, that's the whole point. And there are so many movements, and the entire book by Rebecca Solnit is about showing how much um, it's impossible to know the impact of some actions. And so she has this beautiful image where she says that history is not like a, an army marching in a line. It's like a crowd that kind of goes sideways. And, and she has loads and loads of examples of um, movements that seem to be like failing and failing and failing until they actually succeed. <coughs> and I think that one of the things is that, and I really agree, is that the question after one action, one occupation of one restaurant, is that, is that efficient? Does the local government care? It's a stupid question because, of course, after the first one, they don't care. Is that one of the things that, for instance, liberated, um, uh, kind of um, illustrated very well, is that they start caring when you come back and come back and come back, and that your message is very clear, so we're not going to go away. And none of the social movements that have actually managed to gain some successes managed to do it after one action. It's like it doesn't happen like that. It's like, so it's this. And I think that, in, as you said, in the NGOification of, um, of politics, that's one of the problems is that NGOs need to be able to claim victory, um, to be able to keep you know, going, and so I can still get donations. Is that, so very often they are, they are <coughs> strategies that aim low to be able to, like, you know, to have quite low standard, to be able to, um, to have victories, to be able to you know, keep going. And I think that that's... That, we need to still have ambitions and to be able to, to keep going even when we're being told that it's not working and pointless because history shows that you don't, you don't win after the first match. <laughs> you have it in a very, very long um, condition, but it's like uh, the main thing is to, and, and to have, so when you talk about mental health, I think that's a really, really important point is that how do we find, um, ways and practices amongst ourselves to keep each other going and to not rely only on ourselves and not have these you know individual machines that keep going come what may and then burn out and they need to be replaced by another wave of activists because we keep having the wave of activists that burn out so we need to find ways to actually support each other through this so that we can keep so they, we can keep going and going and going and make sure that they understand that they're going to have to change because we're not going away. That's one of the difficult things. And what do you do for this, for example, to be sustainable and avoid burning out or helping each other? Do you have some practices actually? Or? I mean, we, we're not experts at it. <laughs> I mean, I had a burnout uh, this summer, for example for three months, pretty much, and it was a health thing, but it was kind of came out. Uh, but I think one of the beautiful things is that we work and live in collectives, so there's always other people around, and I think that's one of the key things to share that despair, and to share, and, and to be able to share those things with, 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 with friends and, and people you're working with. And also knowing that if you burn out, then someone else might take the thing. It's not just all you, and if you burn out, the whole project will collapse or whatever. <coughs> so for, for, for us, it's also about having shared lives uh, and realizing that despair is not just an individual thing as well. The despair is a systemic thing. It's a you know, it's, a, it's not just a, to, to try and shift that, that that idea that despair is just an individual psychological problem that is actually caused by you know by all these other things. Um, and and I think one of one of the 
this is a thing about uh, but not burning out, but also trying to uh, be able to live a, a, a life that is the least, uh, that is the most coherent with what you're fighting for as well. But I think a lot of people burn out because they're fighting and fighting and fighting for something, but they're like, oh, my everyday life, I don't care about my everyday life, I'm just going to be a fighter. And, and, and actually, their, their life itself isn't healthy. Uh, and I think that's the other thing. How do you create a, a, a situation where you can have a more healthy life uh, that's more coherent with what you're fighting for, rather than always fighting, fighting, and waiting for that moment? What I found is that actually doing a lot of creative experiments, um, it really helps because it makes it more fun and I think that's one of the great causes of burnout is when also when you get into this kind of sacrificial mode, you know, when it's like sleep deprivation and it's that and start, you know, you don't eat so well and you start drinking too much and it's just like and you're hampering with the feeling people around you don't understand, you know. It's like you're the only one who sees how bad things are and you start getting more and more exhausted and potentially more and more bitter about the people around you that are not doing enough, they're not doing as much as you, so you can do even more because you need to compensate for all these, you know, lazy people around you that are not doing this stuff. And you have no pleasure anymore in what you do, but you keep doing it because, you know, the cause need great sacrifices. And I really don't believe in that. I think it doesn't work. I think that it actually brings bad activists. It's like not bad persons, but bad activists in the sense that, you know, in the thing about creating desire is that, you have, I mean, you know, I think that we probably all know people, when you see them, you're like, wow, I don't want to do that. <laughs> it's like, your life doesn't sound that, you know, fun. And actually finding pleasure in, in that political um, activism is, for me, something that is so important. And doing really creative, and you know, this is personally, I mean, I'm not trained as an artist at all, um, but that's one of the things that I love about uh, doing projects with people who are really creative, is to have, to, to allow space to be crazy and to have totally the mental um, idea that are totally unrealistic and that, you know, where you let it out and you give yourself some <coughs> work on that. Because otherwise, it's that, you know, if you're only about what is not possible and what you can't do, then it's like, you kind of die with it inside. And I think the other thing to remember is that even if we lose, you lose, your campaign loses, whatever, doesn't seem to win, the fact that you're fighting and you're doing it with incredible people, and the friendships that are made in that, I think is, a, is, is I'd rather that I die knowing that I fought with incredible people around me than, the, than I didn't, you know, that, you know that, that, that there was, you know, I made incredible friendships with people who had courage and, and you know, and were coherent and, you know, for me that's already a win in a sense, you know, to remember that, for that, you know. And to, 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 Trying to be present in the moment, I think a lot of despair often comes about trying to think about the future. And actually, I think, especially around ecological issues and, 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 and so on, I think if we get too much in the future, I think that's also a dangerous uh, way. I think the more we can be present in the present moment uh, and, and enjoy and be in the moment in, 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 in now, knowing that you're fighting for the future and that you're connected to the past, so it's not about a kind of neoliberal, I'm just going to live for the present, but it's, it's about really not, not, you know, not thinking that the future is ever set. Uh, 